relevant as a rap. Many words suggest life and death, fears the dead past, recollections of the vibe, resurrected and lifting, found still dynamic, but perfected that is alive. Among the wishes to see the past is the wish to see it alive and complete. The stirrings of birth, visions of repressed memories are alarming. I took this as an epigraph, and it didn't really mean anything to me when I did so, or not too much, and it began to actually take on a life of its own. Um, the second epigraph is from Bataille, There is nothing hidden, a misery and the truth of the love. The truth of love. Love. Does it need to determine or the beloved being is indeed acquainted with the truth of existence? So this is a very uncynical approach to uh, love. Um, and I insist upon it actually that there is nothing illusory, there's nothing delusional about love. It is the only truth we know. Time's assassin, obviously, again, is an archaic notion. It assists upon a certain kind of universalism. Music <laughs> is time's assassin. It makes it disappear. It makes it meaningless. So this, again, archaic, old-fashioned notion of love and music and things like that as capable of annihilating time and space through precisely an eternity principle or an immortalization principle. Um, it may be something very different. I mean, my favorite definition of time is time exists so that everything doesn't happen at once. And one can apply the same idea to space. Space exists so that everything doesn't happen in the same place. So it's this cut. Nobody knows what time is, obviously. But this notion of time's assassin is Bataille. Um, and it, it insists on art as a kind of immortalization device. What does art do? This is also classic listener. Art takes a segment of this time and pulls it up into a realm. What is this realm called? Call it what you like, trans history or heaven. <laughs> uh, at any rate, it operates from there on out in a trans historical way. And trans history and the notion of the trans historical is another way of talking about eternity. It then may have a downward causative effect on time as we know it, political time, um, but it exists in another realm. Um, and these two realms are not conflatable. They are not the same realm. That, that is the idea. I doubt it on some level, obviously, but not entirely. I think that that is a, and closely associated with this notion of idealism I think that they're intim I think they're intimately connected ideas, idealism and eternalization. I used to listen to Jordanian radio all the time when I lived in the Middle East, and the 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 guy would take popular American songs and he would break them down and separate out the music and the words. And this was the English lesson, and every became everything became really crazy and kind of. Alien, that was the whole point. Baby, I love your way. And it went on and on like this. And I think I might read a little piece on that. Uh, same thing with Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson is a Palestinian obsession. Absolutely. If, you, if somebody knows you are from the States, then they will immediately bring up Michael Jackson. The, the, the Peter Frampton example brings me to the second thing I wanted to do here, and I changed the talk to deal with parody. Um, and as again, Ben reminds us um, in his essay, parody, parody's beginnings, very ancient notion of parody is precisely the separation of music and speech, the words and the rhythm. What does this do? What does this do? And so when I started looking at my own writing, this is the question that really began to preoccupy me besides the political anti-political thing, um, was what was I trying to do in this with these pieces when I put in bits and pieces of song. Um, and also, um, it obviously, because it's a text, we have de facto a separation of music and um, speech, word and song. So this is, this is what I decided to do next, <laughs> was I was going to talk about parody. Um, 
And so the effect is, I think, exactly what uh, Agamben says here, is that something that is highly serious is turned or transformed into something comic. All the while, the formal elements are maintained, but they are subverted as if from within they are turned against themselves. Um, and there's also a kind of mourning for the time when song and um, speech were one and the same. There, that is the hidden nostalgia um, involved in and with parody. This is a very interesting thing to say, what Agamben says here. In approaching a mystery, one can offer nothing but a parody. Any other attempt to evoke it falls into bad taste and bombast. So, <laughs> so th this, is, this is the uh, catch when writing about something highly serious. Mm -hmm. If you try to turn it into comedy, it's really not laughable on some level. Um, at any rate, you are, you are kind of stuck with this approach. It is very difficult. This is the problem of tone when talking about highly serious matters. Because while it may be bad taste to indulge in tragic pleasure or the pleasure of fate, that which has no hope left in it whatsoever, um, at the same time, um, comedy is obviously also inappropriate. How does one talk about things that are deadly serious? It's very difficult to do. Formed, and were you to visit, you might have to sleep under a painting of an almost life-sized exile, group of exiles walking across a bridge of skulls and bones above a torrent of blood or something of that order, a fact that did not stop many from visiting, but neither did it contribute to small talk and sweet dreams. The stuff is everywhere. Invitations, accusations, exercises in the untranslatable, plays, leaflets, directives, graffiti by the dozen, Martyr cards passed around by kids in the West Bank and Gaza Strip as if baseball cards, murals hung not so long before in the mosque of Gaza City. Posters, a Mujahid, a fighter commanding the faithful, a tree hung with the dead bodies of Israeli soldiers as if Christmas ornaments, red poppies sprouting from land irrigated with the blood of martyrs, an exploded egged bus smoldering on a road littered with broken bodies, a bomb detonating in a shower of apocalyptic orange a foreshadowing of the end of the world. Inventories of the dead and soon to be dead, videos of the last words of boys held bent on paradise, videos of their funerals, videos of the interrogations of collaborators punctuated by clanging pots and pans, roosters crowing, donkeys braying, babies crying, an entire homey peasant world ostensibly oblivious. We have dozens of such videos, all variations of the same story. The photographer's house had a dark room tacked onto it, cantilevered out over a flagstone courtyard, held up by a precariously angled stilt of negligible proportions. Inside, one felt as though when we're dangling above the abyss, there was nothing beneath you. Through the thin walls, we could hear everything outside, Hasidim praying for rain in the shtetl, a tiny synagogue down the street, children shrieking in the playground below, yellow-eyed Egyptian cats raging rooftop battles above our heads, the couple across the way talking sweet talk over breakfast, a mere 10 feet or so separated us. The old woman downstairs sweeping the flagstones, pausing now and then to blow antique kisses to God. On many an afternoon, we'd retire there to develop and print the film we'd shot earlier in the week. Closing the door, we'd turn the dial to the renegade Israeli station, Abby Nathan's voice of peace, quote, broadcasting from somewhere in the Mediterranean, unquote, or Jordanian radio, which liked to alternate peons to the late King Hussein with daily English lessons administered via, via American-style pop. Ooh, baby, I love your way every day. Want to be with you night and day. The radio English teacher would repeat after Peter Frampton enunciating each syllable so distinctly that English began to sound like another language. The song's close would bring with it an exposition which would go something like this. It means he loves her. It means he likes everything she does. It means he wants to accompany her in the morning and in the night. We'd laugh a bit as we washed our new prints under the citrine glow of the dark room lights, the little box on stilts, perhaps quivering ever so slightly. The temperature in the tar-covered shack often exceeded 100 degrees far above the limit for properly developing anything, so we'd plop ice cubes swaddled in plastic into the steaming deck tall, 
and when at last our endeavors would pay off and an image materialize in its final bath of water and sweat, it was never exactly what we thought it would be. Beyond the possibilities of overexposure and underexposure, the technical vagaries and miscalculations, there was always a surprise in the photo itself, or something we now knew that changed the photo or how we felt about it. So every Romeo and Juliet story, and there are many, many of them, anytime you have a situation of conflict or war, you're going to have a Romeo and Juliet story. And I think I still insist um, on these stories being anti-political, meaning they belong to another realm. They can be secondarily politicized, but at heart, and it, in essence, they are anti-political. I think that particularly now, the insistence on the political and the anti-political is more important than ever, and people should really be rereading Hannah Arendt, who in my estimation was one of the greatest political thinkers of all time, said she, of course, Hannah Rises Love is something radically anti I don't, I, I, I call every book she's ever written and but she does, she does in many, many places. She insists that there are things in the world that are absolutely But after World War One, we have this one. <laughs> that would be a different kind of wristwatch. And I, I mean, I adore all of these, all of these political and religious representations of time. How does one define time? And we know that in the Western world, we have the vision of all time, not according to, not according to wars, but according to the life and death of one individual. That's truly something people forget. It has nothing to do with what you're talking about, this, this notion of time that we stand for in God. We have B.C., meaning the war of Christ, and A.D., the year of his death, Anno Domini, or in Judaism, BCE and CE. But this is only one way that time might be counted and told. And it's it's uh, religious and political. <coughs> it's really political. Um, but it has nothing to do with uh, time with a capital T. Right, and that's the start. Is, and then there is love of the world, and love of the world is indeed. Um, belongs to the realm of politics. But I was thinking, like, just if applied to Romeo and Juliet, just the romantic love is the catalyst, but then why they stay together is the politics behind, between themselves, you know, like, them negotiating to keep this going on, and this, despite their differences. Right? I, I, I agree that at some point the despite and because maybe switch places. I, I still insist that the first, the first impulse is, is, uh, is despite these political obstacles, it may turn into because, in the sense that any, any um, I would say, erotic movement in general requires obstacles in its path. And if it doesn't have those obstacles, it creates them. You're also not going to go watch a romantic movie that begins with, I love you, the three words that must be absolutely forbidden since the whole point is to amplify, is to say I love you without saying I love you. <laughs> and that would be the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and then World War II, and then we, we goes on and on like this, and the entirety of human history is divided according to war. And one could claim that war is actually, in essence, anti-political. At any rate, it, all of time is divided according to before and after. And, the, and war, I would say, like erotic love, is a totalizing experience. It is absolutely total. It takes over everything, just in the way we just described time. And it changes everything into before and after. Just like a, a beloved person, place, or thing changes everything. There's before and there is after. All of time becomes divided in this kind of way. Which shows, I think, that it, that whatever it is, it is anti-political. It absolutely interrupts political time. <laughs>